Welcome everyone to episode 32 of Popcorn Peeps. This is the podcast in which we venture through the Hollywood Reporter's top 100 films of all time and give our thoughts along the way. My name is Jordan and in this episode we are going to be discussing the 2000 epic historical drama Gladiator directed by Ridley Scott starring Russell Crowe, Joaquin Phoenix, and Connie Nielsen. The film won five Academy Awards as well as four BAFTAs and today to break this movie down I am joined by Craigamus. All right everyone I want a nice clean fight. Saramus. Maximus, Maximus. And Christmas. Christmas. Are you not entertained? <laughs> Christmas was the best yeah, one. I know. That's why I, I didn't even see where that was going. That was beautiful. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That's why I had to put it last. All right, folks. What did you guys think of Gladiator? Type. I look at it compared to Braveheart as like a spectacle movie, and I think it just does everything so much better. I care more about the characters, I'm more invested in Maximus, the fights are sick, and I like that the movie isn't about the fights, but the fights are a tool to get him where he needs to go. And I love historical fiction. Two thumbs. So I have not watched this before because I thought it was, like, I think they did themselves a disservice by calling it Gladiator because that's what I thought too was it was going to be like, I, I'm not watching three hours of people being eaten and beaten to death in a ra uh, coliseum. But this was awesome. It was so interesting. Like, it was one of those ones where, yeah, it was three hours, but didn't really notice. This movie was three hours long? Mm -hmm. 40. Holy smokes, it certainly didn't feel like it. Exactly. See, that's my point. And you wanted to kill yourself in Braveheart about halfway through, right? Yeah. Not any more than normal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Film is interesting because uh, certain stories can make an hour and a half feel like six hours and certain stories can make three hours feel like an hour and 15 minutes. When, when you queue up a movie, sometimes you don't know what you're going to get. So how long was Amadeus? Like three hours. Six Not hours. So, <laughs> so, so comparing these two being within like, you know, rock throwing distance of each other time wise this one went way faster it was way better paced i think this is one of the few three hour long movies that really deserves every minute of its runtime i didn't feel like there was a single lull but um first of all about the title um i'm also confused why it was called gladiator chris because they don't look very happy in the arena they look kind of miserable i think they should have called it sadiator instead oh <laughs> <laughs> oh and Who's second, editing this episode? <laughs> and secondly, oh, this film I'd was I'd like to make a formal request that that joke be removed. It can't no, be. No, we love it. Uh, and secondly, this film was an absolute treat to experience. The characters were raw. They had emotional motives on both sides of the conflicts. They were separated by hundreds of kilometers and even more soldiers, but they're fated to clash in Rome for all to witness. The term epic gets thrown around a lot, and as such, I feel like it's lost a little bit of its meaning, but this was very very epic in that raw textbook definition. What do you guys think of our characters? Let's start with Commodus, who is denied the position of emperor, gets really mad about it, <laughs> retaliates, murders his father, claiming Rome for his own. What do you think of this guy? I find it amazing that you want to start with the best character, so it's just a slippery slope down. I'm just so excited to talk about comedy. <laughs> Joaquin Phoenix kicked the shit out of this role. He was so good. Oh, yeah. The emotion that he portrayed, I, I mean, you don't like the character, right? Because he's a monster, but he's so well played. Wait a second. He, he wasn't the protagonist? <laughs> <laughs> That, that is a thing about him is when it starts out, maybe you do feel a twinge of sympathy when you see he f didn't feel the love of his father, da, 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 da. But then as you see him evolve, you're like, oh shit, like this is so beyond that. Like he's obviously using that as an excuse to justify how bad he is. And Commodus is one of those interesting because he was a real historical emperor who was so much worse than what the movie did with him. So you could have done, like ran the whole gamut with him. I, oh, Joaquin Phoenix was amazing. I feel bad for the other actors because they do a good job. But when you have someone like Joaquin in the role, just absolutely yeah. slaying it. One of my favorite performances I've seen from any actor on this list, period. Like, if you're not on your like S tier A game, like just comparatively, you're gonna get you're gonna get blown away. Similar to like Heath Ledger as the Joker, like all the acting in The Dark Knight is great, but like that one performance just steals the spotlight. I absolutely agree. I was thinking about that afterwards. That it's like watching The Dark Knight and the Joker's performance being so so incredible that it overshadowed everyone else, and that's what happened in Gladiator. Russell Crowe's portrayal. Maximus wasn't bad. 
it was actually, you know, it was good. It was believable. He loved his wife. He, you know, he was heartbroken about what happened to his family and everything. But under the shadow of Commodus, he might as well have been, he could have been played by any B actor. They mm-hmm. didn't even need him in the movie. And I think because it's so subtle, I think when you have a bad character, sometimes that's almost easier because you're not forced to make them really likable. It's easy to find somebody to hate. But because of how subtle he was, it was just so believable. Nothing was over the top, even considering some of the shit that he did and what he said. It's interesting because it's kind of like a one-two punch. Like, yes, you want a great villain, but what makes the ending of the film so satisfying is basically based on how much you want to see Commodus get shanked. And so Mm -hmm. the better job Joaquin does, the more satisfying the ending becomes because if he can build himself up higher and higher and higher as this sleazy motherfucker, this asshole, he can just, he just makes that hatred fester inside of you. It makes that ending scene so much better. Like if, if the character wasn't fun to hate, there wouldn't be any emotional resonance with the final scene. It also makes Maximus more memorable yes. for being for being this for being the polar opposite of this very memorable character of just being this stalwart man with one goal. He has one mission left, and that's to get vengeance. You have this guy who's trying to play all of Rome. He wants to dissolve the Senate and kill all of his his opposition and on the other end you just have one man who doesn't want control he doesn't want power he doesn't want praise he just wants to kill that guy Mm -hmm. i never thought i would root to see more of a character who's consistently trying to breed his sister (laughs) 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 but here we are Uh, Which was great for developing his character, by the way. Not only did it show how shallow his circle of trust was, because as an emperor, he could probably marry anyone he wanted, but more importantly, it increased his creep factor so much, which is ironic anyway, because the one person he thought he could trust that he wanted to sleep with was the one who betrayed him anyway. So I mean, it kind of bit him in the ass, but... Uh, I just thought it was there's so much good tension there and so much so much subtlety between the interactions between him being so paranoid looking around every corner to see like what his options were keeping his circle close but wanting to be so aggressive with his ambitions it was it felt very multifaceted and at no point did I feel like the character felt flat or shallow. Yeah, this is a good lesson for all of you would-be tyrants out there. No one will be faithful to you if you're trying to betray everyone, take all the power, and murder the people you don't like. <laughs> Eventually, you'll be betrayed and killed. The end. Worth it. <laughs> what, are, what are some of your favorite commonest moments from the film? The scene where he confronts his sister when he finds out she's running around behind his back and he's with Lucius there. Oh, he's such a creep in it, but it, the delivery is amazing. And you see the emotion, how hurt he is by her betrayal, but yet mixed with that evil that he'd be willing to, yeah, hurt her kid. And I believe he would. That was a really powerful scene. It's uncomfortable in all of the right ways. Yes. I liked Commodus in the Senate when he had just returned to Rome and he was talking to the senators right when he had returned. And he kind of had this like playboy returning from war kind of on the big shot in the room, almost acting like he wasn't trying to be aggressive to the Senate while subtly putting them on notice. It was it was really well done. I'm trying to think of a specific scene. I just it's just his overall performance and that like oh he's on the edge of losing it, right? He gets so mad he looks like he's gonna cry. You know, like yeah. that mm-hmm. utter frustration and he's he's he is no completely unaware of his self. He thinks that he is completely wronged and everything he's doing is justified. He's the protagonist in his own mind. He's a little baby man with a big stick. Victim mentality. My yeah. favorite moment for sure was the moment you had brought up, Sarah, but If I were to look at some other ones I thought were great, I do really like the scene when he's trying to convince his father that he is a virtuous man at the beginning of the movie, being like, no, 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 bravery, heroics, I have virtues, just not those ones. I'm a good guy, I promise, like, really? (laughs) And his dad's like, yeah, I'm not buying that. (laughs) It's like Slytherin trying to convince the other houses that they're valuable too. Yeah. We're ambitious and greedy and mean. Those are technically values. (laughs) And just when he shows up after the battle's over and he's like, I missed it? I'll slaughter a hundred bulls for you. <laughs> and the dad's like, okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good consolation prize. Thanks for showing up. I don't have much to say about the sister Lucilla, but how did you feel about that character and her performance? I think it could have been anybody playing that part. I don't know that Connie Britton, is that who it was, I think? Did anything spectacular? I believe it was... 
Connie Nielsen. The whole crux of the character is just to kind of be that foil between Maximus and Commodus, but those are the two stars. And I mean, scorned lover, I guess. She played that role well, but was able to get past it. But eh. Does this movie pass the Bechdel test? I don't think it does. No. Does it pass the what? The Bechdel test. I don't know what that is. Not even close. Oh, what? I thought you for sure did. I thought we talked about it before. Um, I'm not going to get all the rules right, but basically um, you have to have two named women having a conversation that doesn't revolve around a man. Oh, uh, okay. I think she was the only named women woman in the entire film. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. So that kind of makes it hard. I wanted to bring her up just because we had a little bit of a focus on some prior episodes about the role of women in some of these greatest films of all time. And I really thought that this was a, a better step for the portrayal of women. She was powerful. She had stakes. She put her own kind of skin in the game here to make a better world for her son and for Rome in, in general. And I really enjoyed that. But I did think the whole development of the ex-lover storyline really held her back. I think if she has feelings for Maximus from prior relationships, that's fine. But I think acting on it in the way she did really devalued her and really turned her into an accessory when she really didn't need to be at all. First of all, his wife just got her fucking toes scorched like a week ago. And you're like, I'm going to roll up into these DMs. Like, A, very Our insensitive. funeral's like the best place to meet women sometimes. Or like, In my meet experience, a partner. Yes. <laughs> Maybe she's... Like, can you kindly fuck off? <laughs> I don't know. If she has these feelings and she doesn't act on them, I think it builds her as a character because she can then read the room and it shows that she's more competent than, in this case, her just caving to her her a womanly desires oh the big maximus i need you she was a good character she was important moving the plot along and i agree with you jordan the the whole unrequited love thing did nothing for me what i think would have been a better execution of that would have been something along the lines of her maximus clearly had a past right and if she had been manipulating that relationship to manipulate Maximus to do what she needed him to do to try and free the Republic, similar to what we saw in On the Waterfront, right? It's actually, there's definitely parallels there where we had, was her name Evie, Edie in that e movie? A where she was- <laughs> Eva where Marie was, Saint uh, played her. <laughs> she was using the, the relationship she had with the dock worker and the priest to manipulate him the doc he the dock worker into betraying the union that's what we should have seen here was the the princess or whatever whatever her name was uh, manipulating this relationship she had with maximus to get him to try and go grab his army and free rome yeah. Instead, we got this woman who, with a broken heart, who is sad that she couldn't be with her gladiator boyfriend, and nothing went well for her at the end. I would rather not have it as another manipulative woman, but I think it she did a good job because she was doing it under the guise of helping her son. And at, Maximus was clear, like he wasn't that into her. I don't think he either of them had any hope that they would be together. And by the end of it, she's just like, this is more important than what it was. So I was fine with her getting past it. Overall, this is a movie about gladiators and men at war. I wasn't expecting a large female representation to it, and I wouldn't really at any war movie. I was fine with this being the one female. I just thought it was so close, in the same way that Young Frankenstein was so close to having that female character be be really cool. I, I don't know. It's it like right up to the line, but they don't they don't quite make it. We can move on. What did you guys think of our boy Maximus? Love Maximus. I just like that he's the complete, you know, Commodus are obviously complete opposites and just as a person and how he's so honorable and he cares about the people he's with and that's why they choose to follow him. And then the stark contrast to Commodus just striking fear into the hearts of everybody and that's why they are forced to follow him. He's just at first fighting because he has to. He wants to get home to his family. It's just a job for him. It's just because he's probably has to sign up for the Roman Legion. And it's not his goal. He doesn't want to be a fighter. He doesn't want to be a gladiator. But then as soon as he understands, he has that chance to seek his revenge. Cool. Game on. And But it's the same way he's respectful to everybody that he's fighting with. He is encouraging them. And he's like, let's work together as a team. We're stronger. Versus just that soul mentality. I just need to preserve myself. 
you're hitting a lot of the points that I was thinking too. Like he devotes himself after his family is killed. So I'm going to be a weapon. I'll be the spear that pierces Commodus. And that's his focus. But throughout his experiences, he doesn't lose that virtuous, honorable mentality. When he's in the ring, he's doing what he can to protect the people around him, to keep them safe. He has his focus and he has his purpose, but he still can't let go of the fact that he wants to help the people around him. And I think it's a great way to build his character, even in action scenes and contribute to that, that honorable, that noble persona. The problem with that persona is it can make the character a little one note, right? Part of the things that makes char make characters interesting is their flaws. And he, you know, he's sad because his family's dead and he's angry at the guy who killed them. That's about as deep as his flaws go. And that's not necessarily a bad thing when you're talking about a hero, because when you want a hero, you want something that's kind of a clean slate so people can put their own faces on someone like Maximus and relate to the hero. Oh, I, yeah, I, I feel just like him in this moment. Those of us who aren't tyrannical like Chris, who saw Commodus as the hero, <laughs> really, it, may, it might do that. But... That happens in a lot of movies and video games as well, where a character either doesn't have very much dialogue or the dialogue they have is just a badass comment here and there. It's so that the audience can put themselves on that character and live the movie through their eyes. I think they did, did a good job doing that with Maximus in this movie, and I wouldn't really change anything. He was total, a total neutral blank for me. He, he's a self-insertion character. The, the one thing I did right uh, at the beginning of um, at, the, at the beginning is that good is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> because like i just you know how he's like haha i'm gonna be uh oh <laughs> yeah I, I actually we should mention that chris you have a, a good point there right so when commodus kills his father and claims the title of emperor he gives maximus one chance shake my hand we'll be bros nothing needs to go crazy and maximus out of his honor and virtuous spirit tells him to go fuck himself and dooms himself and his family like you have to know that's not going to go well for you right the most powerful man in the world just extended his hand to you and you told him to go fuck himself yeah, yeah read the room maybe and, read the room yeah. like, read the room <laughs> and i don't care how virtue like i like to think that i you would you know rage against the machine but in that situation <laughs> you just fucking shake his hand yeah and then you go get your kids and you hide in prussia yeah, and you plot to, to kill him. You don't go like, fuck you, man. he's in charge of everything. <laughs> Maximus was just a bro who was good at his job, but sick and damn tired of that nine to five grind. Just wanted to go fuck <laughs> off to his farm, hang out with his kids, grow a little garden, chill. But all these pompous Romans are like, nah, fam, we're too dumb or too stupid or too old or too lazy to solve our own problems. We need you. And he was just sick and tired of that bullshit. <laughs> Does anyone know why they called him the Spaniard? Because he was from Spain. The, the, the original reason for being called a Spaniard. So like when he was riding his horse, he was riding it from Germany to Spain to go home. That, that makes a lot of sense. I just think it was funny that when Jen was sitting next to me watching this film and the kids die and you see the to little sooty toes dangling there, Jen's like, I'm on board. We need no further development. I'm ready to watch the vengeance. <laughs> And I thought it was so much better done than comparing it to Braveheart where his wife was murdered and I still didn't, wasn't too invested in it. It's still that reluctant hero kind of thing, but Maximus just delivered so much more. I like that in a lot of instances, there would be a big pause here where Maximus would be distraught and he would be mopey and he would be slumpy and it would take a while for him to really figure out his purpose. But I like that we just spun on a dime here. He's like, I'm running, I'm out. And then he sees them and he's like, I'm going back in. And we didn't waste a single beat getting back and getting the story back where it needed to go, which I appreciated, which is probably why it felt so, so breakneck compared to some other films. Sarah, I think the reason that didn't feel disconnected is because they did a good job at the beginning of the movie, letting us know Maximus has been away for war for uh, at war for a long time. And the only thing he wants is to go home, see his family, grow some olives, ride some horses. And he mentions that over and over again to different people. Oh no, I'm done. I'm retired. I'm going home. What are you going to do after the war, Maximus? Oh, I'm going to go home and see my kids. I have, like, see my kid, whatever. And then before 
before he even has a chance to have it, which is the difference with, with Braveheart, right? William Wallace does have good times with his wife, and we see that, and we enjoy that. Before Maximus even has a chance to see his kid, and he probably hasn't seen his kid since he was an infant, because he's mm. been away at war, it's taken from him. <sighs> so the anger is so believable, that he, because he's been robbed. 100% Craig, well said. What are some of your favorite Maximus moments from the film? I feel like my favorite Maximus moments are just in relation to Commodus and because that's where he really comes out as a good versus evil or even oh, oh my favorite part I'll put is any of his interactions too with the one other slave gladiator slave I forget what his name was we got it like once and only because the subtitles were on yeah you wouldn't have known they never said his name yeah. but it was just in the subtitles Juby Juba Juba yes Juba. I think my favorite moments for Maximus were when he's standing in the arena and Emperor Commodus would put his thumb up or thumb down as whether or not someone should be killed. And he would just do the opposite. Just just to throw mud in his eye. Just, just you know, fuck you. No, I'm not going <laughs> to kill him. You know, just like, no, fuck you. I don't want to. Come do it yourself, bitch. Like, <laughs> It's not really like a good moment, but just something I found funny. Uh, I laughed when Maximus first wins in the Colosseum and Commodus comes down to meet him and asks him his name. <laughs> and Maximus just replies nervously with gladiator and then walks yeah. away like in some universe that's going to satisfy Commodus <laughs> and he's not, <laughs> he's not going to okay. get any shit for that. <laughs> Granted, it does bring out a cool moment where they see each other face to face. I just thought that was an odd way to get to that point. How about you, Chris? Yeah, I don't think he's a great character. I'm just trying to think. Yes, the, inter the are you not entertained is fine, but I'm like racking my brain trying to think of like some big standout moment, and there's not. Well, what did you guys think about the combat scenes? A lot of them were really good. There was some, and we we mentioned this when we saw it. There was a lot of what what happened at this this period of time because I think this is about the same time that uh, Lord of the Rings came out, where the a good action scene would be happening and then an awkward jarring slow mo. <laughs> Oh, that was so for bad. about three seconds and then it'll go back to chaos it was it's not slow-mo it's a film technique called engulfment and the purpose of it is to be disorientating to you and make it harder to see what's going on you're hearing the sounds but there's fuzziness and you don't know what's going on and you're immersed or engulfed in this battle uh it's bad whether or not it works well. whether we like it or not <laughs> is a different thing it's yes different. just because they did it intentionally doesn't mean it was a good decision we had a, we only had one really big large scale battle at the beginning between the the northern army and who are described as the barbarians and despite the fact that yeah we have all of these great costumes we have tons of actors it was not a good fight to watch because of that a technique you mentioned but there were so many quick cuts it was so jarring and difficult to follow that even though all of the pieces were there it seems like the execution was just a little bit sloppy at first i thought like oh maybe they're doing this slow-mo thing because they didn't have enough segments long enough to really piece together the choreography so they're stretching it perhaps but no as you said it's a, it's a technique and we see it later used in fights in the arena when there's far less moving pieces and so you know it's a creative choice it just seems so strange but uh, on the upside, at least we did get a really cool aesthetic with the red uh, Roman flags kind of flowing over the bluish white snow. I did think that was really aesthetic and reminded me of the scene from The Last Jedi where they're on the salt planet and beneath the salt is this red sand. And when the guns start firing, the, the two colors mixing together is, is really nice. And that's actually what it reminded me of. The, the, the one nice part about Last Jedi. I wish I had the energy to quote you from a previous episode of Popcorn Beeps. I'm going to give it a try here. You're comparing this movie to Star Wars? <laughs> I'm just saying it used the same aesthetic, and I appreciate the aesthetic. God, I feel like it's weird. We're on the opposite sides of this conversation right now. <laughs> I do think the fights get better. I think in the arena, the fights are much easier to follow. They are cool, but honestly, I never once felt like Maximus was ever in any real danger. So as such, they felt very superfluous. The spectacle was there, but without consequence, I was just waiting for more dialogue scenes. I was like, okay, is the fight over? Let's wrap it up. Let's move on. Let's get some more character building. Let's get some more, some more interactions between our cast. So I think Sarah mentioned this earlier, but that's because the movie is called Gladiator, but it's not about the arena. It's not about a man in the arena. It's these fights are just tools to get him from stage to stage closer to Commodus, right? That's all it is. Mm -hmm. He needs to win them. The fight scenes are kind of eh. 
they, they were good, don't get me wrong, but they weren't the focal point of the movie. Sorry, when I say they were kind of eh, I don't mean they were bad. They were good, but they weren't the focal point of the movie, right? The focal point of the movie was Commodus in the dark room trying to find ways to dissolve the Senate and his sister in another dark room trying to find ways to stop him from dissolving the Senate. That's what the movie was about. Yeah, that's exactly what I why I didn't watch it for so long. I agree, but if you're going to have connective tissue in a film, you never want to have filler connective tissue, even if it serves the grander narrative. You want all that connective tissue to be of substance in a perfect world as interesting as the rest of the pieces. I think it was because it looked at him not just surviving, but he also had to be entertaining because he needed the crowd to have a vested interest in him so that Commodus needed to keep him alive so he could move on to that. It wasn't just him getting in there and fighting and winning. He was trying, he was following what his mentor said and become like that star athlete, entertaining. It was also kind of a containerized version of what was happening in Rome, right? Because Maximus, he had the focus of the people. The people were entertained by him and they were fans of him, but he defied the emperor at every opportunity. And the emperor wanted to get rid of him, but couldn't find a way to get rid of him without causing a serious problem. That's the same problem he had with the Senate. The Senate would defy him every time they had an opportunity, but he couldn't just kill the Senate because the people followed the Senate. He couldn't just kill the Senate without having a revolt. He couldn't just kill Maximus without having a revolt. So what's the man to do? He has all the power in the world and no ability to use it. What's the man to do? Maybe make better decisions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Final comment about the fights. The sound effects were fucking terrible. When they were punching each other, <laughs> it, it sounded like a comic book movie. It sounded like a 1960s, like Bruce Lee, like, whoosh, whoosh, ah, Boof, movie. Pow, bzam. <laughs> Biff, zap. <laughs> what did you guys think about our conclusion? It was beautiful. It was tragic and hopeful at the same time. No, no complaint. Like, kill the main character. That's fine. Let's make it hard for a sequel, though. I don't think there was a better way to end it. And it does a couple couple cool things to, to elevate this final conflict. A, we have actual stakes now. This is the only battle in the film that really matters. So I'm, I'm excited. I'm sitting there. I'm munching my popcorn. I'm looking ready to go here. I love that Commodus inflicts the wound prior. Not only is that within character for him, but it also levels the playing field. And it gives us a great throwback to a scene earlier where Commodus is shown training with a blade and he's insanely good. And so since you have that prior, you can now build on that by showing that this is not a stretch to have Commodus come out and think that now that Maximus is wounded he can best him with a sword in front of all of Rome and prove his his authority since it's building on that framework it doesn't feel like an ass puller it doesn't feel random and you get this really exciting battle and it concludes Maximus's arc and it concludes Commodus's arc I don't think you can do any other way and so even though maybe like a the the, the double suicide is a little maybe like overly poetic I think it did a good job of tying the bow and even his costume to come out in that all white when before we were seeing him always in darker colors, he was really trying to give off that, I'm a good guy, I'm in all white, I'm fighting this guy wearing all black, but you really know what's lurking underneath. Costumes are so good. Maybe if I woke up and I could put on these Commodus outfits, this insane level of drip, I would be a narcissist too. I get up, put on my sick white armor, look in the mirror, I'm like, you the best. <laughs> look how stylish you are. Try it. <laughs> I don't think we need a, I don't think we need a confident Jordan. That's too dangerous. I didn't know that Jordan could get more confident. I, I thought know. this was <laughs> So one of the things I liked about this ending, so this is, this is how tyrants grab power, right? They would do something like, poison the legislature and make them weak and then go to the people and say look how weak your legislature is you need me to be in control and that's what he did with the gladiator he went and wounded him so that he could well look how weak he is now i'm strong and you should be fans of me right there's a lot of good symbolism in this movie and they did it really well here now unfortunately what can happen in 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 societies is if a tyrant poisons the legislature and then fails to take control, you just end up with anarchy and the state <laughs> falls apart, a la ancient Rome. So a, another tip for you would-be tyrants out there, sometimes it's better to just control the legislature and let them believe they're in control than threatening to take down the entire establishment just because you're too weak to rule. Uh, I believe that's called the uh, Hank Scorpio hypothesis. I don't get the reference. 
Oh no! Everyone should have a boss like Hank Scorpio. Simpsons. He's like this. He's like a James Bond evil genius, except he's super nice and. Oh, he's the best boss. He's the best boss in the world. Like Homer has another story on his house because he gets the nuclear reactor yeah. up two percent. <laughs> <laughs> but he's like he's totally deranged right he's like oh mr scorpio i was making a cup of coffee i couldn't find any sugar he's like oh here i got some sugar and he reached in his pocket he just got like a handful of sugar <laughs> like, there you go hold on to that <laughs> some people are pocket sand people some people are pocket sugar people are pocket <laughs> sugar. Oh, what did you guys think of the soundtrack bangers i would say uh like mid high range beautiful really really nice artistic not gonna listen to it though you're a fool. Listening to this music was a big deal. Firstly, because it changed my perception of one of my favorite musical scores of all time. <laughs> the iconic theme from Pirates of the Caribbean. The dun 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 is literally just a remix version of the Gladiator action music. Hans Zimmer, an amazing composer, had hands in both films, but it feels kind of bad to know that what I thought was one of my favorites was literally a paper that he had already handed in from a class last year, but now he has a new professor and he's handed in the same assignment twice. He just changed the font. <laughs> yeah, reworked the intro a little bit. <laughs> oh gosh, but like the tracks, uh, the Battle and Barbarian Horde had that signature Pirates kind of sound, but they were great, they were epic and fun. And it was diverse enough that you had other tracks like the earth that was soothing and kind of more had like a fantasy kind of feel to it like something you would listen while cruising around skyrim it had its bases covered so fact check hans zimmer didn't come in until the second pirates of the caribbean so does that mean they got a knockoff for version one and then thought we'll call in the real deal for the second third and fourth hank zammer my understanding is that the guy who did the first pirate soundtrack collaborated extensively with Hans Zimmer, and I believe Hans Zimmer was affiliated in some way uh, as like a consultant or something like that. I don't know. I know he did have a hand in both at some point during their production. I don't know if he got like the full like like uh, like the main credit for it, but I believe he was involved. Story of my life, Hans. So like, do I just is this my new favorite soundtrack now, just by default? <laughs> I feel like I need to introduce you to some actual classical music. Just because it was done before doesn't mean that it can't be improved on, right? It was literally this, so close. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't even think you could claim like, oh, he did it, but he had a better version that he came up with later. Like, Why not? It's, it's the it, same. No, it's just like, it's, it's the same. different. It's not improved. I disagree. It's it, the it same. It's not the same. It was not the same. It's like having different drafts of the same type of work. Like, just because dra draft one was the first draft you wrote, never hand in draft one. Draft one sucks. Hand in draft mm. four. It's way better. Imagine doing a paper in more than one draft. <laughs> I, I do have one fun fact to close things out. Oliver Reed, who played Proximo, died during a heart attack while filming Gladiator uh, in 1999. According to witnesses, he was at a local pub and was drinking with sailors who were stationed there, and he consumed just a ludicrous amount of alcohol, passed out after consuming, like I think his tab was like 600 US dollars, and then passed out and died on his way to the hospital at 61 years old. Like, what? Wow. So anywho, the movie wasn't done filming yet, and so they had to bring in an effects team to digitally create two minutes of footage to finish his scenes out. It cost them $3.2 million. They had to film them in shadow and basically map a 3D face onto this guy to get the rest of the scenes. In 2000. That's impressive for the technology back then. I don't, I don't even know what scenes, but yeah, he kicked the bucket halfway through and there were two minutes worth of footage left that they just needed, and so... He did a killer job, though. Well, a killer guess, job. Well, ah. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I guess you can't trouble. Hey, Russell Crowe, I know you did all these scenes with this guy, but can you redo all of them? And Russell's like, actually, I have a, a new movie I'm filming in Paris next week. I can't be with you, darling. And they're like, oh, shit, I got to get, I got to digitally slap this guy's face on here or something. I have a quick discussion point. So Ridley Scott had said that the script for Gladiator's sequel has been written. Which I don't get. Yeah, I don't get that either because he's saying it would be what would have happened if Maximus didn't die and it just sounds like an all-around bad time. Why? I want when Commodus didn't die. So actual history? Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like Clue. You know, like this is how it could have ended, but actually... It would be actually interesting to see Maximus take control, finding himself in a situation where he's in control of Rome, trying to hand power over to the people, but 
there's no real good way of doing that without while also trying to deal with all the corruption and everything. So he finds himself in a, a place where he didn't want to be, which is as the tyrannical emperor, trying to find a way and maybe he's getting towards the, the autumn of his life and he's getting old and he's trying to find a way to wrap this up before he dies so he doesn't have to hand his power off to the next generation because he knows it'll never get handed back then. That would be an interesting story to watch. I would, I'd love to watch it. An emperor in his last days trying to figure out, like Marcus Aurelius, trying to figure out how to get the power back to the people before he died. Shred the script. I don't think it's needed. Well, A, because not only are we going to lose Commodus, we're going to have to deal with some more of this bullshit romance between Lucilla and Maximus, which I don't want. True. Likely. Yeah. Just have her die off screen between movies. <laughs> Problem solved. She was run over by a donkey stampede. <laughs> Next. Just, just mention it. Oh, yeah. Sure wish she was still here, but that horrible accident at the market <laughs> marketplace. And <laughs> You guys ready to rank this bad boy? I am, yeah. I think so. If you're following along with the YouTube video, there's a link at the top of the description to check out where we've placed the films we've seen so far or on popcornpeeps.com. However, Sarah, where are you going to put Gladiator among the films we've seen so far? So I talked a lot of talk before because I was calling it my number one. I'm not putting it in my number one spot. I still think 12 Angry Men is better coming from just a story point, but I am going to put this in my second spot because it's still a sick movie. So second place between 12 Angry Men and On the Waterfront. I really liked this movie. Loved a lot of the symbolism in the movie. I thought it had a lot of interesting things to say. However, unfortunately, it's not a romance. So it's it's not that high. Uh, Craig loves love. <laughs> so it's going to go in number nine below Brokeback Mountain above Wally. How about you, Chris? So I'm not sure that I feel like I need to rewatch it. Maybe I will now that Sarah has says she's watches it over and over. Maybe I'll get more out of it. Um, it was good. I actually, even while we were talking, flipped it around a bit. You know, my standard way of going through the list is I start at the top and go, was it better than this? Was it better than this? First, I had it in spot 10 above Inception, but just as we were talking, I flipped them. So it takes spot 11, so still a great movie, but not quite as good as Inception. And Brokeback Mountain is still above it. Because it's hard to beat love. Ah, well, this movie does, because I'm putting it in third place. Under Memento and above on the waterfront. Sarah and Jordan value vengeance more than love. It just slaps. Just slaps. I love a good vengeance. Makes the world go round. Vengeance makes the world go round? <laughs> It's a great motivator. <laughs> So's love. Eh, overrated. Is it though? <laughs> uh, Maximus was willing to go home for love. He was willing to take down a tyrannical emperor for vengeance. And love. No. It wasn't about love. It was no, about no. settling no. the vengeance. score. Yeah, that's not... What fueled his vengeance? He had no vengeance until they took... Exactly, but he wasn't going to do it until when it was Until they took love. away his family for whom he felt so you think he was going to do this if they would have stayed alive what no i'm saying the no, only reason no. he did this stuff is because they took away the thing he loves yeah but that doesn't mean he did it for love he did it for so get, give, give, doing it for love is potentially becoming the emperor and going home doing it for love is what lucilla did love is an inert item and it is impacted by the catalyst that is vengeance creating the spectacle you have seen that's that's a bad the worst definition of love i have ever heard love is like this inert object that has no power by itself it's just a thing and you can take it or leave it with no consequences it is the gasoline in the car that is vengeance <laughs> What are we watching in the next episode of Popcorn Peeps, Chris? We are going to be watching Monty Python and the Holy Grail, which is very exciting. It's I've seen it several times. Not the best Monty Python, but still a great movie. And it looks like if you have the Netflix, you will be able to watch it for no incremental cost. There are other options to buy it, but I don't understand why you would. And if you don't have Netflix, get Netflix for a month so that you can watch it. Before we conclude, I'd like to extend a special thank you to those who support us on Patreon.com. Special thank you to Erica Wilson, Buster Hyman, <laughs> Tyler Laporte, Sarah Renier, <laughs> Frank Costa, Ryan Saarinen, Jim Wamsley, Travis Laporte, and Craig Lewis. And I would like to say sorry to Tyler Laporte, who got booted off the last episode. Uh, my bad. I did not read your name. I'm sorry. 
Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you in episode 33. Have a great time, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Buster Hyman took me a second. He just snuck it in there.